Good evening and welcome to Talk Pixa. It's been six months since an oil palm development project began in Mandras in the inland mining area of East New Britain. While some locals see it as development, others see it as the destruction to their homes, forests and most importantly their land. Twelve families have already been displaced, their homes razed and cocoa blocks destroyed. MTV's Kokopo-based journalist Edwin Fidelis visited the affected areas and has this story. Mandras in the North Binding area of East New Britain province is one remote and isolated region. Census estimates put the total population of Mandras and its surrounding communities at around 20,000. They are one of the last groups of East New Britain people to be discovered by the early missionaries and they are popular for their traditional ritual dance, the Binding Fire Dance. The people here rely largely on cocoa farming to generate a steady flow of income all year around. But their life is now under threat when an Asian oil palm developer was allowed into their area by an indigenous landowner group to plant oil palm. The region consisting eight villages have been divided by the oil palm project. Some have opposed the project while others have strongly supported it. The indigenous landowner group says they allow the Asian oil palm company into their area because they want development. They believe opening doors to oil palm farming will pave way for new roads, schools and health facilities that they never got before. Within the long run, we have been like this. It's about time that we need to come up with a change to get these people developed. Because the moment we're going to wait, we'll never get anywhere. The once cocoa-dominated area is expected to give up most of its land in the name of oil palm. All money pull in this kind of project, belong come inside, meaning he all the same, and belong half him all. Now, he good plan too that he can bring him some plan, good plan service, he come inside long all people. Long blood time finish, old man, he been walk long hard walk long, carry more something long backside. Now, enough and enough. This used to be a forest that was once used by the binding people as hunting and fishing grounds. But when the oil palm company came, it cleared all the forest and displaced the people who live here. Today what's left of it is a clear piece of land that stretches for more than 65 hectares. Three to four generations, eh? like that. See, well, palm, all plant, all like this beauty, like some like a cell, like a bag, all you walk, walk, me stop. But me blow him also, me blow come to see Palusa. Me blow no right, lo complain, lo this, because me blow and come up underneath, lo all that's all. So, time suppose me learn on that, me can write, lo complain, lo on him something, and me look him straight or not straight. So, can something all same. All yet, all you walk, this beauty, Gaga, me, me, blood, no, got power, lo, sun up, lo, sad, lo, talk, talk, lo, lo, this, lo, again. When the cocoa pot borer swept through East New Britain province in 2006, thousands of cocoa trees were destroyed as an interim measure to contain the pot disease from spreading. This has prompted various agriculture institutions to conduct researches funded by overseas donors, such as the World Bank, to find a solution to the disease. This cocoa nursery is the main supplier of newly hybrid clone cocoa seedlings managed by the Binding Cocoa Cooperative Society. It's a result of a decade of hard work by the Binding Cocoa farmers. The cocoa nursery was established by the cooperative with assistance from the World Bank as a rehabilitation project to revive the cocoa industry in East New Britain after the incursion of the cocoa pot borer in 2006. But the coming of oil palm into this area have already threatened cocoa farmers to abandon these seedlings as their land allocated to plant cocoa have been taken over by oil palm. Because the oil palm is going to be a block of plant, and the block of well, no plant is also supposed to be some cacao, so I plan on giving cacao because it's a bag of rap. So I plan on giving the small farmers now. So I plan on giving the same, so I plan on giving the small farmers now. So I plan on giving the small farmers now. Like 
no ka disla ka na developer mo yung pamilya mo na ino disla bimol famous all this koko ay may gopin is lol famous while filming this story I met Caroline Kande and her sister they owned two hectares of land that they planted with koko but all their koko trees were destroyed to make way for the oil palm development. Very much in this land, now all working me, I'm planning on that. I'm planning on that, I'm not sure about my place. I'm planning on that, 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 I'm planning on that. I'm planning on that, 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 I'm planning Amarang yang masil, dia kacau sekarang. Ia mual pamgadan, tinggadan ni, dia kacau kena matlu. Dulu tu kacau kena sil perkori dip. Tadi dendir dia urak kau lu ngrawan no. Tak kacik a, tadi sama sermen dendir dia mak kawa. What has angered the people here is the lack of consultation between the cocoa farmers, the oil palm developers, and the provincial government. Caroline and her sister are part of the Boining Cocoa Cooperative Society, who is opposing the idea of bringing oil palm into their area. The cooperative is now making a strong representation of its cocoa farmers. An assessment has been carried out by the cooperative to find out the costs of the damages that is expected to run into several millions of kina. The people here know too well about the problems that oil palm will bring. The legacies of oil palm farming in the West New Britain and Million Bay provinces are viewed as precedents of future oil palm development in Papua New Guinea. While well, those who supported it see it as a positive move to improve the lives of the binding people, those who opposed it are skeptical about its development and its long-term effects on their surrounding environments and their livelihoods. You're watching Talk Pixar. The cooperative movement in Morobe is taking off in a big way. No longer are they working in isolation. Each movement is reaching out to like-minded groups and individuals to build relationships. The Lower Watut Koko Cooperative is a fine example of a people-driven movement. In our next story, Scott Wyde looks at their success. Along the Watut River of the Morobi province is a cocoa cooperative movement of 16 cluster groups that's transforming the lives of people. For the people here, the only means of transport to lay is by motor canoe, and this is where hundreds of tons of cocoa have traveled on the way to cocoa buyers in lay. At Siat's village, one of the 16 cluster groups, it has become a community effort to increase incomes and improve their way of life. Um, past time, me play been ino been planning kaka. I must say me play been develop boy. So go na sick been bagar been boy na me play stop. I think four, three years something. Na me play safalo. Kind help him most him. That's all. Behind me play. Maro mai ni been game all sick block kaka. Na me play nesser him. Na me play plan him. Okay, I'm coming inside. I'm going to school. I'm going to play. I'm going to play. I'm going to play. Na mas kemap kut. Igo, I'm going to kemap. I'm going to give school again long. Brukim, na mumuim, na cooking lo house, block si money. So now I'm playing. Now I'm playing. Start making this all work. We all been talking. I'm playing long. In one quarter, this village has the ability to produce up to thirty thousand kina. It's a sizable income if you grow your own food and don't pay for water or electricity like people living in urban areas. So money block ako, mi play kasi may mi ito kasi may mi big pla, ay mi winim money block boy. Na MEC, mi plano one tap long diwa, mi play snap tasa long ground na wasted more pot na kisim. So money block ako, mi alright. 
Transporting dried cocoa to lay is difficult. In a motor canoe, you can only carry so much. But it hasn't stopped the Lower Watut Cocoa Cooperative from becoming a recognized leader in cocoa production in Morobe and a leader in quality overseas. Michael Toliman, who has lended his expertise as a former government extension officer, has seen encouraging developments, including international recognition of the high quality cocoa this region produces. Mi pula bin salim sampla sample long sampla bias from Singapore na sample tu ol bin salim ko lo cocoa expo long Switzerland na mi kama pim ol sem excellent chocolate na perfect chocolate antap longen cocoa liquor ol li kolim ol sem world class cocoa liquor and mi come from this la area blo watu. Cooperatives in the Morobi province have seen a huge amount of success in the last five years. Initially, each cooperative started because of simple needs, school fees, building materials, water supplies, and the need to improve their way of life. Over the last three years, they've started reaching out to build their own networks and share their common interests and goals. In 2013, the government began showing genuine interest in people-driven cooperatives. Commerce and Trade Minister Richard Maru traveled to the Lower Watut area where he shared the experiences of the East New Britain cocoa cooperatives. Before Tamolino started, he got one plant to sponsor by Mkopra. And I'm going to go to the CPL. 50 to the CPL. But all my place no got choice. Tamolino start price him double now. Always is low by him copra. Now man no place to go so me plan now give him long or come come by give him straight long as place company. Today they buy over half of the total tannins all produce him all match him price now over time got price all over. This is a company today making big blood profit only ready to build him new blood oil mill blood all start to go around by him ship blood now. I'm cooperative company yeah 12,000. I'm just sending me finding motion number one also I give him rebate low volume number two all line of place, all respect him as a management and run him, competent management. All not disturb number out. Now, also we respect him, all line, all mark him, board, now leadership. It spurred renewed interest in the cooperative movement once popular in the 60s and 70s. Political interest came with government funding support. In Boana, support was given to a previously unknown coffee cooperative, Neknasi, which initially began with the view to help parents find an income. Me, I'm one of the elementary teachers, so I started looking for them. My papa and mama are not going to school fee. So I decided to come up with this cooperative. This is a cooperative now. So, me myself, I'm a man who finds a market for coffee. So, bring him money to the community. Or, come to the man who or papa mama, long, all my buy him school fee for picking him from all now. Picking him from all my come up seven man. Neknasi has since grown and extended its reach to connect with other farmers and other cooperatives. Its experiences are being shared, and the relationships are being built and strengthened. In 2011, 2010, all along New Zealand, the SPC along Fiji, all the time, training me plan, putting me plan going along Fair Trade program. Me plan going along program. Now, all the time, 2011, 24th April, all the certified me plan, all the time, this is a license from Trade Long, New Zealand. For coffee cooperatives in the landlocked district of Kabum, networks are also being forged with like-minded groups. In Bulolo, the district will be spending 5 million kina to buy a coffee plantation and capture coffee production in the Watut and Menyamia areas. What's left now is a demand for the national government to introduce freight subsidies and reduce fuel costs to allow for the cooperative movement to grow.
You're watching Talk Pixar. The Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary has been involved in a joint program with the Australian Federal Police in efforts to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of policing in the country. The program's focus recently shifted to the discipline in the force. PNG Australian Partnership Program Commander, Assistant Police Commissioner Alan Scott, spoke to Talk Pixar about the instilling of self-discipline in our police recruits as opposed to the traditional imposed discipline. We are past the first 100 days of this program, and it's a program that's starting to pay off dividends. Since the 100-day mark, a lot's happened. Could you please tell us about that? Well, Neville, we've been very busy. Uh, when we last spoke, I told you and your viewers about the work that we've been doing in the police stations in Port Moresby and Ley. We continue to do that very important work. That means working alongside the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary members uh, in the front office, uh, in uh, the cell management, uh, in, and in the police station management. We work very closely with the police station commanders to improve the performance of all of the police stations uh, here in the national capital and also in Ley. So uh, that's really a, a fundamental part of the work that we do here. Uh, and it's been uh, from the arrival of the AFP uh, in November 2013 uh, to the present day. But there have been some changes. Uh, in particular, Prime Minister O'Neill and the Police Minister Robert Atiafa specifically asked the AFP for more training. Uh, and we've been uh, putting more AFP officers at the Bamana Police College nice. uh, to actually deliver training packages. And the Police Minister was very, very keen on the recruit course. Uh, he did have some concerns about the recruit training program. In particular, the minister th felt that uh, the recruits were not disciplined enough and that they didn't have a rigorous program of study. So the AFP uh, assisted the constabulary with redrafting the recruit program uh, and there's now a 26-week program, fairly intensive, and the AFP officers are actually working alongside their counterparts in the constabulary and delivering uh, that training program. So that's a really exciting initiative on our side. We're very pleased about that. Uh, the minister specifically asked for it and the PM uh, was also very keen on it. Uh, and we started that program in January this year. So it's currently underway. Uh, the recruits will graduate in August uh, and we're very confident uh, that that will deliver a much more highly disciplined uh, graduate from the college uh, and recruits that have a better understanding of police powers, of uh, arrest powers, of the laws of evidence. Uh, and Neville, what we've done in that program is make it much more practically focused. So we have a two-week practical component where the recruits actually have a, an exercise that they run through where they get a complaint about something and they follow up inquiries and they take witness statements uh, and they execute a search warrant and seize some evidence uh, and then put together the brief of evidence. Uh, and the Chief Justice here uh, agreed to provide judges to participate in a mock court Okay. So the recruits get to appear before a real judge uh, and give their evidence. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a great thing that we can do that in the uh, environment of a training college uh, and give practical experience so that when they graduate, they've actually got a bit of confidence about them and a bit of understanding of what they're going to uh, be doing in a police career. So uh, we're very pleased about that uh, training initiative. The other part of the training, uh, Neville, is the training in Australia. And it's been widely covered in the media about the officers that have gone down to uh, the Northern Territory Police and the Queensland Police and the AFP in Canberra. Uh, in fact, just in the last two days, we've brought all of the RPNGC officers uh, back together that have done those placement programs. And there's 54 of them. So uh, we've been very busy uh, sending officers to Australia. Uh, and we brought them back together to share their experiences uh, of the training in Australia and help us build a better program for the people that will go in the future. Uh, we've also had the great uh, privilege of inviting to Port Moresby uh, members of the Queensland Police and the Northern Territory Police that have helped out uh, with the program. So they're here uh, today uh, with the, uh, the people that have done that placement program and they get to see uh, this side of it, which is really useful. Uh, for Australian police officers to come here and, and see the working environment and understand more about policing in Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. So that program is a four-week placement. They go into the hosting agency, they have an opportunity to move around into different areas and then they settle into an area of their own expertise. So if they're a sexual offence investigator here, 
in Papua New Guinea, then we'll place them into uh, sexual offences investigations or traffic or CID or general duties, depending uh, on the person. And then they come back after having had a really solid exposure to something quite different. Uh, and we're very keen to make sure that that translates into something here. We call the program Make Em Senis. Uh, so we're trying to promote a change, uh, a different approach to things. Uh, it's not about saying you must do it this way. It's not about saying the Australian way is the best way. It's just an exposure to something different. And we take from that what we can and we hope uh, that the people that have done the placements just get a different insight. Uh, and that makes the change. So we're really, we're really excited about all of those initiatives. So the, the recruitment, the current recruitment, the, they, they pass out and in August, you said? That's correct. And obviously the operative word is discipline. Now the courses that have been, the new courses that they've been undergoing, does that include discipline out of the uniform? Absolutely. So there's the discipline within the college environment. So as you would understand, uh, there's certain things that have to happen. Uh, the recruits have to wash their own clothes and uh, do a drill, marching around, uh, and uh, physical exercise, and they have to be punctual. And uh, that's, that's a, a discipline which is very important. But what we've tried to do in this new program is emphasize self-discipline. Mm -hmm. So not just an imposed discipline, uh, that you have to do things because someone else tells you to do it, but a discipline that comes from within. Uh, and we have uh, lots of studies about ethics, ethical characteristics, ethical behaviours. Uh, all of the squads have their own set of values that they uh, come up with and they have to adhere to those values. So we're really trying to promote self-discipline and that's the discipline that will also be in place when the officers are not on duty. And this has been a, a big problem for the constabulary in the past where uh, there's been criticism of misbehaviour of the officers uh, out of uniform and off duty. So we're really trying to promote that discipline that comes from within that will be maintained at all times, not just at work and in a uniform. And we're very hopeful. Uh, it's, we've really put the emphasis on that. Uh, that has been uh, received very well by the recruits. Uh, and you know the proof will be in the pudding. I've said to the minister, uh, I'm confident, sir, that this is a great program and will deliver uh, much more disciplined officers than you have had in the past. Okay. And that's all we have for you on Talk Pixar tonight. If you've just joined us or missed any part of tonight's show, you can catch the Talk Pixar replay on Wednesday evening or find the full program online at www.mtvonline.com.pg. And until we do this again next Sunday, I'm Neville Choi. Good night.